Ready? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to thank Fortune Builders for inviting me here. I think it was really nice of them just to give us a platform about an hour to help you further educate and grow your business. And what they asked me to do while I was here is to talk to you about three critical areas of the business. One, falling under asset protection. What, what is asset protection? How does it work? What's the importance of it? How does it affect you today? Even though that maybe you haven't started a business, do you still need asset protection? We're going to cover all of these bullets. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about is uh, tax savings or tax mitigation. Right now, unfortunately, you know the average individual pays 20% more in taxes than they would, what they should be paying each year, and we're going to talk about ways that we can lower that or things you can do as a business to help offset all of your tax liabilities, not just for your business. The third thing we're going to talk about is going to be dealing with business credit. What is business credit? How does it work? Would it be a tool that you think you might be able to utilize to help grow your real estate business? So we want to cover them, and we're going to cover it in that order. And here's my reasoning. My reasoning on it is that if we're going and talking about assets, if you don't have any assets, chances are you have no tax problems. Right? And if you have no tax problems, you probably don't need capital. So we want to do things in a particular order because we want to develop you in that way. So one of the first questions that I get about incorporating is, when should I do it? When is the important point or the important time? And, and so here's how I'd like to start off. I'm going to tell you guys about an individual. He's a, he's a carpenter. And he was uh, kind of running to, to his end in his career. And he was about 20 years in with the same company. And he decided that he wanted to retire, get into something, you just try something different, have a you know, change of pace. And he gave us two weeks notice, but he had a problem. His, <laughs> his employer didn't really want him to leave. And, and, you know, but he realized that he had you know, he paid his dues and, and put his time in. And so he asked him to do one last favor for him. He said, here's what I'd like to do. I, I don't know how I can repay you, he goes, but you're the best I got, and I'd like for you to build my house. I want a new house built, you're the only one that I trust to do it. I'm gonna give you every resource you need. There's no budget, there's no time limit, just when you get it done. Now, keep in mind, from his perspective, he was already out. He's already just one foot out the door, he wanted to be done with it. He rushes a little through the job, maybe a little too quickly, doesn't use the best foundation, he doesn't put the best you know, insulation and the best land, you know, landscaping. But he does what he's supposed to do. He gets it taken care of. So several months later, he goes back, he puts the keys on the table, and he looks at the uh, employer and he says, I'm not. He goes, we're friends. I like to leave it that way. I'm out. So he slides the keys across the table. And at the same time, the, the employer stops and he pushes the keys back. And he said, you know, you've been such a great employee to me. I had no idea how I could repay someone for the loyalty you've had for my business. So I wanted you to be, have the opportunity to build your house the way that you wanted, with everything you could imagine or dream of without a budget so that you can spend the rest of, life, rest of your life there with your family. And so I tell you this story because my, my question to you is, do you think knowing that, that he might have used better concrete yeah. or a better layout or used the best materials in building this house? So thinking of you now as a business, thinking of you starting a business, do you put the roof on first or do we build the foundation first? Foundation. Foundation. So what is the right foundation? Now there's a few ways to look at it. But the most important question is, how am I going to structure and how am I going to operate my business? What am I going to do that's going to be in the best interest of me, not for just the short term, but for the long term? So when we look at it, there's three typical responses that I get when I talk to a lot of my clients about what path they're going to take. So we're looking here, we've got sole proprietorship, we've got general partnership, we've got corporations and LLCs. Now, starting with the sole proprietorship for just a second, when you think of sole, what does that mean to you? Yourself. One, one. one right? So effectively what you're saying is that you're new to this business, maybe you were successful in some other type of business, but now you're so confident that you're going to be successful in this new endeavor that you would, you're, you're asking that the courts be willing to take away everything you've ever owned, built, or developed in your life if something was to go wrong with this new business. Because of your confidence level, you're saying that's what I want, that's how confident I am, I'm going to be successful. But it doesn't make any sense from a business owner because if you get sued, all of your assets now become part of that lawsuit, and that's the first thing we want to try to avoid because you might be doing this, right? This might be the first time you're trying this out. So we want to make sure that you've got it. So then we talk about a general partnership. And, and what's a general partnership? Anybody know what a general partnership is? Two people. Together. Yeah. Right? You have two individuals. So you have two sole proprietors. They're going to come together. They're going to do business. So now not only are you worried about all of your actions, but now what you're saying is I'm also going to be responsible for everything that my partner does. And should my partner get sued, would you please come in, take my house, my bank accounts, and my cars to help pay for his loss? Right, because that's what a general partnership from the legal aspect truly is. So here's an example. I have two clients, well, three clients, now two, out of California. 
And they decided they were going to have a general partnership. They came together and they were going to start an online business selling uh, supplements for weightlifting and vitamins and things of that nature. And within their first year, they had netted over $4 million in gross profits. So now what we have is we have three sole proprietors who really thought that they were very good at being businessmen. And one of them thought he was so good that he took all of his profits that he made and he turned around and he opened up five other businesses within that same year. Now, what happened to them is when the two owners that were not part of those businesses came to work one day and they tried to access their bank accounts, they started to realize that everything they owned, both personally and professionally, was seized by the IRS. And the reason it was seized is that those other five businesses were not very successful. And when they went to go collect, this third partner was nowhere to be found. I don't even think they found him yet. He left, but he left them paying the bill because even though that he had no obligation to tell them about these other businesses, the bottom line was because they were all in partnership together and they were all linked, every asset that they own now had to worry about things that he was doing even though they had no idea it was being done. So this ended up costing over $400,000 out of their pocket just to get control back of their business, which had nothing to do with that. But that's the power of what a general partnership can do if it's not properly structured. And that's what we want to avoid, correct? Oh, yeah. So the third we're going to talk about is corporations and LLCs. So we're going to kind of go into structure. So when we talk about a sole proprietorship, one of the first things we want to ask ourselves is why would somebody choose that path? It's easy. Easy, right? You just go down, you file a DBA, open up a bank account, and voila, you're in business. So I'm James Crothers, and now I'm James Crothers Investor doing business, you know, as ABC, you know, investing. So now I go out and I can go out and do business just like any other business can, but the only difference is is that I don't have any type of legal protection, meaning the state that I'm, I'm working in has no laws there to protect me. I have absolutely no tax benefits for being a sole proprietorship. In fact, I'm gonna be in a, in a higher tax bracket because I'm already right now what pays the bills for the IRS, right? Schedule C is 40,000 new auditors in the last two years. Why do they have 40,000 new auditors? C's, right? So that's why, now the IRS would want you to be a sole proprietorship, so don't get me wrong. If you want to make the IRS happy, you're a sole proprietorship. Now, the other thing is, is you would get your EIN number, open the bank account. Now, you notice the difference between the, the sole proprietorship and the general partnership? There isn't a difference. Because even though that I now might be going in with a partner, the process in which I'm setting my business up is going to be exactly the same. I'm going to have exactly the same problems. I'm going to be in exactly the same boat, whether I'm doing it on my own or with a second person. Okay. But where we start coming in here, and you'll see the benefits is that, keeping it simple, everything's reported on the Schedule C. So that would be the benefit from the process of setting up. The negatives to that is I also realize that I'm going to be in the highest audited tax bracket and be dealing with a lot of those challenges. Now, um, going through here, just kind of retapping that, again, you're personally liable. You're going to be in this position to where everything that you do, and keep in mind that we're not just talking about the beginning, but what happens when you're in your business five or ten years from now? Think of it from, from more of a long-term perspective. Do you still want to be in this predicament or be responsible on maybe a loan or an account you set up on day one that now you have 15 years later but when you go try to sell the business, there's nothing really to sell because it's all still based on you individually. So that's where the sole proprietorship kind of jumps into providing some challenges. Now we start talking about corporate structures, we start to kind of go into a different ballpark. We're talking about different things here. One of the first things that, that you should know about um, incorporating is the fact that when you incorporate your business, that it becomes a separate legal entity from you, okay? So no matter what state you're in, no matter where you incorporate your business, whether you're gonna do business here, or if you're gonna do business in multiple states, once you actually file a corporation or an LLC, you are now considered to have a separate legal entity that you're operating and that you control, but is completely and legally separate from yourself, okay? So we're gonna talk about three kinds here. We're gonna really put more emphasis on the S-Corp and the LLC. So starting with the C-Corp, one of the, the things that we tell a lot of people getting into the incorporating world, C-Corp tends to be for big business. So if you were to look at publicly traded companies or large corporations um, you know, that have been around for many, many years, you'll find that they're C-Corps because of that structure. The C-Corp essentially separates the business owner right, from the business, from a tax level, not just a legal protection. But what we want to talk about today is that most of you that are going to open a small business, well, you need to live on that money. You have to take that money to pay your bills. Yes, right? So you're going to have to find a way to be able to get a hold of that money, but you want to be able to do it at a much better tax rate than paying 40% or plus on your money that you're earning. So we're going to talk about this. So, and another way to reference it is think of S equals short. So short-term income would be what? Wholesale. Wholesale rehabs, right? And then we have long-term, or L for long-term. What does that represent? Long-term 
rentals yeah, rental. yeah. on the property and long-term capital gains right so there's, there's actually four different styles of real estate you can do all are taxed a little bit different and we'll discuss what those differences are so again C Corp's big business S Corp's generally small to mid-sized businesses one of the big advantages of the S Corp is tax savings and we're going to go through a whole section on this but it means that you're going to be able to get access to every penny that you're earning at a discounted rate than if you were structured any other way whether it was as an individual or as a c-corp or llc so here's how we look at it so when you look at the corporate veil we're, we're going to talk about the corporate veil as being a completely this is where the laws come in so i don't know if you guys have realized this but here in your state you guys are around big business would you agree with me on that there's a lot of big business in the state and fortunately they spend millions and millions of dollars each and every year lobbying for the corporate veil. We're gonna get into to what that means. But when you're there, it means there's now a separate set of laws that govern everything that you're doing within your business. When you look at the C-Corp, the double taxation and why it's terrible for investing is because it is for big business and typically the money the company's making is not the money that you're gonna to wanna to live on. It's money that you're keeping in that business where maybe the company's making $200,000 and you're only looking to live on 30,000. You could take it out as a salary versus an S Corp, it's going to allow all the money to flow down to you personally. The LLCs are perfect for the long term because it can be recognized as a sole proprietorship or as a single member. And as we're going through this, this concept, you know, a lot of you may not start today, but down the road you might have rental property. Can anybody tell me the difference between active income and passive income at the IRS level? What classifies that and what the big difference is? Taxes. But what tax? Uh, Self-employment. Self-employment. Right? So on your active income, you're going to pay that 15.3%, where on the passive, you're not, because it's going to be passively earned. You're going to automatically inherit that, so we want to make sure that we have the right structure, accepting the right type of real estate transaction. So going into the corporate veil, so the corporate veil, corporate veil refers to the legal separation, but there's a few things that I want you guys to take notice of. One is that the strength of the veil is decided in the state that you live in, number one. The second thing that you have to look at is that in order to have the protection in your state, there are a number of things that you have to do in order to ensure that you're protected. Can you guys give me an idea of what you think you would have to do in the state? Now, I'm not from here, but I've done a little bit of research here, so I already know. But do you know, as a business owner, what you have to do to make sure that you're compliant in the state of? I maintain my record books. Payroll. Payroll. I haven't looked into it. Uh, renew your State fees every year? State fees. There could be a million different things. There could be from yeah. enough capital to fund it initially to resolutions, amendments, and amendments. There's 30 different parameters depending on common jurisdiction. And it, and it could be as minimal mm -hmm. as issuing stock, yeah. right? So what we hear a lot of is that a lot of businesses, how, and, and normally I'll reference the audience this time. I'll say how many people in here are, are sole proprietors, proprietorships, or how many people are incorporated? I'll give a few hands and I'll go. One of the biggest things that we hear the most of is that people that have started a business that are either husband and wife or single owner, the one thing they don't do is they don't issue ownership. And when I ask them why they don't issue it, 90% of the time they tell me because it's just us. We're the only owners, we didn't think we needed to. So just understand that in this state, if you don't issue ownership of your business, it's technically not considered a real business by the state. And if anything that, that was mentioned was not done, if you don't have the right records, if you've not issued stock, if you're not up to date with the state, are you going to have legal protection when you're operating your business? No, because you didn't formalize your intent. Correct. So you didn't go through that process of education. And, and why do most people not go through that? They really don't understand it. They don't know who to go to. And most people are not willing to spend $350 an hour to learn how to do it right. But what I'm telling you is that it's a must in the state. And you just got to go there. You got to do research and just become an educated business owner, right? Don't listen to your pool guy. <laughs> because even might be great at the poll, they may not be the best person to get advice from running your business, right? But unfortunately, how do most people figure out what they're going to start? They talk to people they know. What we're saying is get the right advice and know why you're starting that business to begin with. Know why you've chosen that entity that you're going to use. Now, this is just some of the, the things you want to look at when we're talking about what could cause or, or why asset protection is so important. Now, I want to start by telling you that I'm not a doom and gloom type person. The reality is, is that most of you in this room may never face a lawsuit. That's the fact of it. I'm also going to tell you that last year, 65 million lawsuits were filed worldwide. And out of that, let me just ask you, at what percentage of those 65 million do you think were filed in the U.S.? 72%. 96%. Very close, 94%. So essentially, there is a new lawsuit filed every 30 seconds in the state, in the country. In the country. Oh. Now, when you think every about 30 that, seconds. every 30 seconds. So when you think of that number, 
you have to understand the few things. One is 98% of those challenges or those lawsuits filed never make it into court. 90% of the time, the person being sued is given an ultimatum to either spend 50,000 and be wrong, or they can spend 250,000 to be right. Now, if it was your business, what would you choose? Smaller number. Smaller number, right? Because right or wrong goes out the window the minute a lawsuit gets filed. But that's what people expect, and that's why there's so many frivolous lawsuits in this country, is they never make it there. So what you want to be able to do is to have a strong enough structure up front that if you're confronted with that situation, you know that you've got a business strong enough to fight it, right? Because most states, if you don't understand what your business, what your state's looking at, and you're out there doing business, you don't know if you're going to be able to withstand a lawsuit. You don't know what's going to happen, and most of the time it's going to prompt you to want to settle, whether you're right or wrong. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other thing we look at is we can deal with, now a lot of you won't have employees, but you're going to be working with 1099. Um, you know, think of it this way, you know, when we look about insurance, I don't know how many of you own rental, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but just imagine for a second that all of you owned a piece of rental property. Say it was a duplex. And that duplex was rented by Joe and you had Jane, both of them excellent tenants, they pay you on time every month, you love them, you love this property because it's just a cash flow property for you. Now, when you were working with Jane, you, you actually leased that property to her, she told you that she worked in corporate America. She told you that she flew all the time. She's going to be in and out all times of the night. So she's not home too often, but she, you know, but you were aware of this. And one night she's coming home, and it's real late at night, and she ends up getting mugged. She ends up in the hospital, and you don't hear anything for about three months. For three months, everything's quiet. How are you feeling right now? Spooked. A little nervous, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen. You're really still kind of kind of in the dark, but when you get notified, it's from her attorney and it's a lawsuit that, that they're coming after you for negligence. So the position that they're taking is that because you understood her schedule, you knew when she was going to be there, that she wasn't there all the time, that there were precautionary measures you could have taken, putting in security, lights, yeah. lights video, something you could have done that would have, could have possibly prevented that. So now how are you feeling? Really bad. Now you're getting a little nervous, right? Because if the judge agreed, let's say in this example that the judge agrees that you were negligent. Is insurance going to protect you? No, no. So what does that mean? What's the next step? How are they going to get? Does that mean the lawsuit just goes away? No, they're going to remedy it against your assets. Against your assets. So that now, now defining assets means everything that you own personally. So it's no longer a business suit. It's just a personal lawsuit that you're doing. So these are just a number of different things that you that can happen just by going through that process. And we want to make sure that we avoid that. So the bottom line is, we want to make sure that we control everything and own nothing. And can anybody tell me? What that means, that line. What what vehicle <coughs> makes that possible? Corporation. 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 Trust. 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 Right. So one of the first steps, or one of the first things that you can do, and, and I usually ask if they have a living trust at this point, is if you don't have a living trust, I recommend getting one. A living trust can play two real critical roles in your business. One, obviously, is an estate planning tool. It's going to give you the ability to decide how your assets are going to be distributed to your family, what assets are going to be distributed. Um, you can also protect future assets that you're earning if you never get them into the trust. There's tools available to make sure they go through the trust. But from a corporate side, from the corporate end of things, one of the other advantages to a living trust is privacy. And you guys might not know this, but in your state, everything is public record. Which is, means that if you go to an attorney tomorrow, what's the first thing the attorney's going to do? <laughs> Asset search, right? Mm -hmm. Through that discovery phase, they're going to want to know, what is this individual loan? And is it worth my time to go after that individual? So they're going to come back with one or two solutions. Either they don't know, right, because they can't find the assets they're looking for, which means that they're now going to ask their client to come out of pocket and pay for their services. Or they're going to say, you know what, this individual has all the assets that I would need to be comfortable going after them. And they're not going to go to their client for any money. Now, what do you think their client's hoping for? Option A or B? B. B, right? But what happens if it's option A? Are they, are they likely to start taking a bunch of money out of their pocket to sue you? Drop it. Probably not, right? They're going to pick up their bag and go down the road. And you did that all by having one simple document in place that's designed to make sure your family stays protected. Pretty easy, right? Yeah. Now, there's a lot of different levels, but what we're talking about today, the whole purpose of the day, is foundation, what's the simplest way to get the most goals or hit the highest goals and objectives. So now we're going to talk about my favorite section, and I'm sure when you guys woke up, one of the most exciting things you thought about this morning was taxes, right? We're going to get a couple of double points. So we're going to talk about taxes, and we're going to really dig into it. And here's, here's how I like to start this piece. I have a client, and she's been my client now going on almost eight years. She's been with me for a very, very long time. When she originally came to me, she uh, only deals with rental properties. She had a number of different rental properties at this time. She was over 40. 
And she was paying $40,000 a year to the IRS every year. She had an account set up, and as she brought in money, she just inherently just kept paying this account because she knew at the end of the day she was going to write this check, right? So it was just a given. And she had come over to us, and we went through this, you know, it took us about a year to get everything structured. It wasn't overnight. There was a lot of transferring of assets and restructuring. But when we got it done, the first full year being properly set up, I remember that she got a tax bill notice from the IRS of $1,440. What, what do you think she did when she got that bill? Paid it. Paid it. What, what do you think she did? But keep in mind, if you got a client used to spending forty thousand dollars a year, gets a bill for fourteen hundred forty dollars. What do you think she she's called paid? to say it was a mistake? Called to say it was a mistake. <laughs> she said this is wrong. I'm going to prison. I don't know what's going on. Fix it, right? So the CPAs they go in, they do their due diligence, they look at everything, and it's right. It just the way that it was structured, everything was depreciating properly, flowing to her. So what was interesting about this client is that. I was currently representing 36 of her clients. She was a private lender. And so I was the one coordinating, making sure that the money was going from her to them and the contracts, and she disappears. Didn't hear from her for 36 days, not one word. I've got our clients calling me every single day asking me where she's at, when their deal's gonna get closed, when they're getting money, and I can't give them any. So you can't give them Can't get nothing out of them. So I get a call on the 36th day, and I said, what in the world happened? I mean, just off the face of the earth. She said, I got so excited about the money that I saved that as soon as I got that bill and confirmed that that's what I owed, my husband and I would drop everything and we went to <laughs> just left. And I said, well, you could have at least notified me because I have all of your clients calling me and wanting your money, right? And she's gone. She says, well, you know, Jim, Christmas used to be my favorite holiday because now it's tax time. I can't wait till next year. And I want you guys to be just as excited as she was and still is on her tax bill. So what we're going to look at is we want to first identify what do you owe as, as an investor, whether you're going to do active or passive income, what do you actually owe? How much money do you have to come out of your pocket with in order to satisfy your state and federal government? So we know going into it that short term, short term investing is subject to income tax of going up to 36%. And it's going to depend on a few factors, right? It's going to depend on, you know, how you're personally set up, what your dependents are. You know, all these factors come in. But let's just kind of take a look at. We're going to say let's just kind of even go mid, and we'll just say 23% or 24% on all the active earnings at the federal level. Okay. Now, in addition to that, you've got state, you've got self-employment, you've got all these other taxes. Now, self-employment happens to be the one deal killer for a lot of businesses, and here's why. This year, went back up to 15.3% of your gross income. Now keep in mind it caps out at 114000 But if you're a business, and let's just say, for argument's sake in this example, that you bring in $100,000 worth of active income into your business, you're going to end up cutting a check for the, to the IRS for how much? For just a self-employment. 23%? 15.3. 7000 something. From each party, yeah. yeah. But what if it's just you, the sole proprietor? How much you have? $15,300, right? Now that's right off the top before you have the ability to do anything to try to lower that tax. That's problem number one. The other thing we want to look at is deducting versus expensing. Can anybody tell me the difference between the two, between a deduction and an expense? Deductions are dollar for dollar, and expenses can be limited based upon the statute. That's good. You have flipped, but that's right. So, so the first thing to understand is that deduction typically means end. So if you are applying deductions, it means that they have already calculated what your tax bill is going to be for the year. So here's, here's a fun fact. So say that your effective tax rate is 23%, and you've got $10,000 worth of deductions to take that year. You cannot take more from the IRS than what you put in. So they're not going to pay you more money than what you give them, right? So out of that 10,000, how much of that 10,000 do you get to take that year? Only a percentage. 23%? Yeah. You, you, can, you can't get more than that, what your effective tax rate is. Uh -huh. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, if you're a business owner, and this is money you need to put back into your business, it's going to take you as much as four to five years to recoup that money. That's too long for a business owner. How can a business owner survive if their money's sitting with the IRS? Not very long, right? And you'll find that a lot of businesses go out of business because they can't manage that portion of their tax. So the question one is how do we reduce that? And we're going to talk about that. The other thing we want to look at now from an expense perspective, right? So when you're expensing something, expense means beginning. So that means that if you make $100,000 and you spend $30,000 on normal business activity, What's your new adjusted gross income? 70,000, 70, right? Now, what happens besides the obvious 30% reduction in your tax? What else have you started to affect with that 70,000? Your AGI, the adjusted gross income. And your effective tax rates, right? Because you guys will all agree that your state and federal tax rates are all based on that gross income. 
So when you're looking at it, it's really based in three stages. You want to be able to expense, minimize your self-employment tax, take your personal deductions, and where are you going to end up at? Roughly about 50% than what you would have been if you're not properly structured. So understand that one third to one half of your wealth as an investor will come from tax savings vehicles. A salary and expense. Salary, yeah, well, yeah, it is First. to the business, okay. yes. Now at the bottom here, you're going to notice long-term investments, lower tax. Long-term investment, because somebody tell me what, what, what they perceive a long-term investment to be. Year to day. Year to day. Mm -hmm. And why is that number significant? Because you're so so. Just tax year. <laughs> But why do they say so? What, what's the advantage to you as an investor if it goes longer than a year? Pay is more ordinary to capital gains. Long-term capital gains means you're going to be taxed at the lowest possible rate of 15%. <clears throat> so, like so with the S-Corp, the way that you minimize it is that if you look at it, the S-Corporation gives you a substantial ability to what we call diversify your earnings. Okay? And what I mean by that is if you want to make $100,000, we already know that between self-employment, state and federal, you're gonna find yourself being at roughly about 44 cents on the dollar in tax, right? We've already established that the first thing we can do is we can expense. So we can make that $100,000 gross earning down to 70,000 and give us somewhat of an advantage on our adjusted gross tax rate, right? But now let's talk about the self-employment. How do we lower that? It's great to know it can be done, but you gotta know how that vehicle works. So the way the IRS puts it is they, they allow you to take your income from that corporation in one of two ways. Either as a wage from the business or a W-2, or you have the ability to take it as what's called a K-1 or a distribution of profit from the business, right? So these are two different vehicles, but the importance of that is, depending on how you take the funds, will determine whether or not a self-employment tax is going to be charged to that dollar you're earning. So let's take the same hundred thousand dollars that you're bringing in. They say you have to take a reasonable salary. They don't tell you what that number is or what the formula. What they say is you guess, and we're going to do. We'll look at it. If you're ever audited, then we're going to go back and we'll adjust it, right? Now, in our example, we have a 30-70 split with what we recommend. You take 30% as a salary, you take 70% as a K-1, and our reason behind it, we have over 40,000 clients nationwide, and we deal with the IRS probably more than we'd ever want to have to, right? But the one thing that we see is when they see 30% or more, they always deem or consider that to be more than reasonable. It's also a safe harbor. It's also safe. Now, keep in mind, though, what's the big advantage? The big advantage is they're saying, okay, if you only have to take 30,000 of that 100, Payroll tax on 30. Yep, now that 70,000 is gonna flow down to you as a still personal income, but it's not gonna be subject to that self-employment tax. How much money a year are we saving if 70% of your income is no longer taxed at 15%? How much money are we putting back in your pocket? A little over $10,000 a year, right? Just by having the proper structure in place. So that's how important having the right entity can be. Obviously lower risks, and the Wall Street Journal did their top 10 uh, reporting on ways to avoid audit. Just know that a number three on their list was incorporated. They didn't tell you how or what type, they just said get incorporated. Because once you incorporate, you're putting yourself at a different level. You're now considered a business in the eyes of the IRS. You're no longer part of that majority that is going to be audited each and every year coming up because of that Schedule C. So you're going to be putting yourself in a completely different tax bracket. Now, with the LLC, some of the benefits of this, especially for the rental or passive income or long term capital gain, just like the sole proprietorship, believe it or not, it's very easy to set up. It doesn't require a separate tax filing. So for those of you that are maybe considering it, that have rentals now, rentals automatically go to your Schedule E at the end of the year. With this structure, it still goes to your Schedule E. So one of the big advantages on the passive side is you don't have to alter or change your taxation. And you also want to maintain the long term. Anything over a year and a day, remember, that's going to stay within the LLC as well. So understand this. It is not illegal to structure yourself in such a way to minimize your tax burden. So a lot of people, when you know, when we talk to them, they go, why doesn't everybody do it? I'm here to tell you a lot of it's probably education. So just up to this point, have you guys learned something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Just Even if you walk out just learning one thing, does that put you farther ahead as a business owner? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But now what we want to do is we want to switch over and we want to talk about the most important piece, and that's money. How many people like money? Oh, yeah. Some of you like money. That's good. All right. So talking about money, we want to kind of start digging in to some of the facts about business credit. and. How does it apply and how can you take advantage of it and when should you start, right? So a lot of you probably are just thinking about getting into business. A lot of you leaving here today will be now your own business owner. So when is now the most important time to start? To now. Now, right? So understanding this, so let's start with the business credit. So we're starting with the stats going back to 2009. Does anybody have an idea just why I'm using 2009 in this reference? Because it was after the crash. The new normal. Very smart. Oh. <laughs> All right, so starting out, so we had 29 
million small businesses in the US. This is important numbers to understand because it's gonna also affect how you operate your business. Out of that though, you guys notice that 99% of them were small business owners. So who are small business owners? Us. All of you, right? We're all small business owners. You guys go out and own business tomorrow, you're now a small business owner. Now, this is the interesting fact. 627,000 new companies were formed. And in the same year, 639,000 businesses went closed or went bankrupt. Why is that a significant number? Why are those numbers important? It's more <coughs> new, less new companies than companies closed. That's why we're in a recession. No access capital. But, but the important thing to know is it was. It was the only year where more businesses went out of business and started in the country, ever. So knowing that, the question starts to break down is, what was the success? What, for those that didn't have to shut their doors, what was different about them than those that had to do it? And we're gonna start digging into this in more detail. Uh, understand this, 68% of small businesses provided at least two years, over 50% survived for the next five years or more. But take a, a special interest in what it is that kept them alive. One was the owner's education. The knowledge that the business owner had in the beginning and how they founded their business probably had a big impact on what their business did when that crisis hit, right? Mm -hmm. Access to capital, a lot of businesses didn't have that. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people a lot of people in business, what they had coming into it was they had personal credit that they used to start their business, but they didn't do it properly. So when their personal credit got cut, it affected their business, right? A lot of you might know someone that had a $100,000 credit card, and then after, all, uh, after the crisis, they had a $15,000 credit card, which was $2,000 more than they owed, but if that was the credit card they were using to pay all their employees. You see where the balance went? So, what, so if that was you, what would you start doing? Going anywhere and anywhere, right? Anywhere, right? You, would, you would look and try to find that money because you realize if you didn't have the money, you would be forced at that point to have to close your business. So now you had a bunch of people going out trying to apply for business credit, trying to get all of this done, and all they were doing was negatively impacting their personal credit. They weren't getting money transferred to them, and ultimately they had to close their doors. So here's some myths. So are credit, report, credit reporting agencies looking out for you? No. No. They are paid to look out for, the, for their clients the same way that you would look out for your clients. The problem is you're the one that's being affected by it. So you don't want to go in with that mentality. Is good credit built automatically? No. The answer to that is no. In fact, those of you who have really good credit probably spent your entire life ensuring that you still have good credit today. And those that have great credit after the crisis really did what? Planned, so right? They planned. Yeah. They were prepared for anything, and they knew that something could happen here, it would affect their credit. They made sure to avoid that path, right? No different from your business. <clears throat> now, does good pers personal credit equal good business credit? No. no. But yet, so many people will tell you, well, you know what, I have a $100,000 American Express card, has my company name on it, but the problem is it's reporting to them personally, right? So we want to make sure to avoid that because the minute it starts reporting personally, is it considered business credit? No, no, no it's personal credit. So why would you need business credit? What are some of the things? So let me start by saying this. How long does opportunity last? <laughs> it's already over, right? It happened that fast. So if an opportunity comes across your door and you want to take advantage of it, do you think you need to have everything prepped and ready to go before that happens? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because if you're going to try to find those resources when the opportunity is there, it's going to be missed. And this is what we tend to find. You need capital. Financing can be intimidating. So a lot of times going into it, you might be dealing with banks. And dealing with big banks, you don't know what they're looking for. A lot of times it's hard to match up their criteria. And I'm going to tell you some of the ways that we recommend dealing with that. Your time is limited and the wrong financing can be costly. The other thing to take note is how you obtain credit. So you usually have two ways that you can do it. You can do it using your own social security number, which is what most business owners do. Or you could build it using your business uh, credit rating. Now, if you're a brand new business, do you think you're going to have to personally guarantee your business? If you're brand new and yes. business is never done, okay, is it okay to personally guarantee your business? Sure. It is if you do it the right way. So here's where we start to kind of make some recommendations. First, if you're going to personally guarantee, make sure that it's for a short period of time, right? Make sure it's not for the term. Talk to vendors that are willing to say, well, when your company's strong enough to stand on its own, we're not going to need you to do everything. But your company has to go there. Don't go where it's going to show up on your personal credit, and you're going to be that personal guarantor, whether it's for five years or 25 years, right? The other thing that's important is when you're going in as a personal guarantor, does it matter if it shows up on your credit or not? Sure. It does, right? So you need to make sure you tell them, look, I don't mind personally guaranteeing for my business. What I don't want is it showing up on my 
personal credit because I need to keep that separate. Okay. Now, keeping in mind, in order for them to do that, they're going to still need a vehicle or an opportunity or a way to be able to report on the business. And that's where the business credit ratings and, and profiles start to come into play. So here's how it breaks down. So we have two, under the person, you have Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. So that's for any of the personal credit that you, that you have. Um, what we work at here is business credit. The business credit we work, recommend too, which is done in Bradstreet, and we have Experian Corporate. Now, why these two bureaus are so important is because they both impact and affect your business in a different way. So if we look at Dun & Bradstreet, for example, Dun & Bradstreet provides you what's called the Paydex score. So the Paydex score is rated on a score of 0 to 100, and anything over 80 is considered to be a AAA business credit rating. Now, why is DMB so valuable as a business? Because one, they're the largest reporting bureau in the country, and a lot of you are going to work with Lowe's, Home Depot, maybe you're going to want to get gas cards or credit cards. A lot of these vendors choose Dun & Bradstreet as the vendor of choice to be able to go and not only report, but to be able to evaluate and determine whether or not your business is credible enough to get credit on its own. So is it important to have a AAA rating? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, because without that, it's always going to be you. There's nothing that they're going to be able to leverage that on. So where does Experian Corporate come in? Why would Experian be important? Because what you're going to find is that while dealing with traditional vendors is good, but what happens after you build your business and maybe you want to go to Wells Fargo or Bank of America and you want to actually lend, get money lent to your business, maybe credit lines, right, or access to cash lines for the business, they're not going to look at Dun & Bradstreet, right? Because Dun & Bradstreet to them, they have unethical sales practices, a lot of banks look at that and they don't agree with it, but they do like to look at Experian, not only from the business side, but a lot of times a lot of people believe that your personal credit is rated on the three bureaus, most of your big banks use Experian. That's their, that's their vendor of choice. And so knowing that kind of going in, does it give you a slight advantage? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because you know how to plan for that. So the advantage with Experian is just like with your personal, they don't charge you money to report under you. But one of the things you can do like on your personal is you can buy into their interface and you can monitor your business credit just like you can your personal credit. But the bottom line is if we build both of those at the same time, now you're not limiting yourself on what you need for your business, whether it's cash lines of credit or true vendors that you need to work with, right? And without credit, so look at it this way, capital for your business is the lifeblood to your business. So the one consistent thing we have in this particular industry, real estate, is that the more capital you have, the more deals you can do, the more profits you can make. And so having as many doors open as possible is only going to give you a, a bigger advantage in the game. Within the first year, this is where we really like to see our investors. Within the first year, you should have the capability of being able to walk into Lowe's or Home Depot, be able to get all the product that you need to be able to rehab a home. We also like to see credit lines in place for our investors where they have access to actual cash lines. Granted, some of these might be personally guaranteed, but that's okay. As long as it doesn't show up and it's truly being utilized for the business, would it help you if you had an extra $100,000 available in your business? Yeah. Absolutely right. It might be the difference between you doing one deal to being able to do three deals in a month, and that's just more profits. So we want to set your goals here and realize it's not going to happen overnight, right? This is a very dedicated process. A lot of people get frustrated and they quit, right? Because they realize, well, there's all this work that I have to do. I don't have time for it. It's too much. I'm not sure what I have to do. But here's what I'm here to tell all of you. If you follow the process and you take the time to get to the finish line, you're going to be unlike any other business that you know right now. You're going to be a business that can stand on its own, that has the capability of growth, and the next time we get hit with a credit crisis, your business is going to be strong enough to withstand that because now it's not working by itself. It's got you as its partner. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we want to make sure that we have all of you guys working together. So bottom line separates the personal and business life, reduces the need for personal credit checks. So keep in mind that every time you go out and every time you're trying to get credit for your business, if you're pulling your personal credit, you're getting inquiries. That's affecting your score. So you want to make sure that you start to balance that number one, but towards the end, the less they have to pull it, the higher your score stays. And your score might be the back end of what's supporting your business. Okay? Reduces the need for personal guarantees and allows access to capital for business expansion. So remember this, if you're not properly structured from the beginning, and things do really, really well, and you want to get to that next point, you might not have the ability to do that if you haven't built the right foundation. Right? So let me just say, is building the right foundation important? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it as important as, as what you need to do to open your business? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. All right, excellent. So on your own, it can take up to three to six years to do business credit. So just like with everything that you guys are here to do today, it's all about coaching. It's about having systems, 
education and the right people in place to help you get to that next level. And that's what Fortune Builders are to do. And that's why they bring professionals like us and help educate you early on on the benefits of doing this and structuring your business. Now, some of the other things that you might want to look into is for a lot of you that might be looking to want to get into this business, maybe using uh, a 401k from a previous employer, or you have access to an IRA, and you want to learn the methods to be able to access that capital to help you start your business, we also have those resources available. We can get into that with you as well. So the way that uh, I like to leave, my mentor would say is that when you guys are ready, right, when is now the best time? Yeah. Yeah. Now. But when you're ready, then we will be here to help you finish it up. You not sell. I'll keep it clean, please. You not sell. All right, then. Yeah, I mean, I don't sell. No, you sell. not sell. You, it's all here. Keep it clean, please. I don't know if I do the doom and gloom that much, do I? No, no, no it's just because no. it's clean. So it should be. 3D events are not for selling. You're not sold. You're great. Yeah. Any no. questions? We subliminally lead you down a path. Uh, on the when we were training, like they wanted to have like an intro, personal introduction. Do you not do that for a reason? I, you know what, I I did when I first started, and I don't personally just because when I'm there, I truly represent Fortune Builders, and so most of them don't even know what company I'm with because I don't know they're promoting CH. They they do enough promotion of us. I've learned that they already know who I am. They know where we're from way before I even show up to the. Oh, okay. Would you agree with that, Dave? Absolutely. The only reason, just to answer that so you know, the yeah. reason why Adam did that yesterday is because we talked beforehand, okay. and I told him what David had well, taught us Well, the other thought is, too, before. is that other events, okay. non-Fortune Builder events, you would take, I would take time to say, this is who I am and this is who we are. For credibility. Yeah, but, and you guys will know, too, when you start doing middles, you'll become really friendly with the speakers. They're going to get to know your, your practice and how you get up. But all of ours, I mean, the minute they know we're in the room, sometimes, I mean, I'm going to be with Pete. I was going to be with Pete, I think, in a couple of weeks. He gives me a 15-minute introduction before I even walk up the stage of who NCH is and why we're so all valuable, what we did for him. And, and so with that, I just kind of feel it's an overkill of yeah. there. Yeah, you remember, too, our, our only job at the uh, uh, middle event is, is for hype. Mm -hmm. And and what's what's the number one thing that we do as speakers when we get up on stage, especially on three-day stage? The number one thing we do is edify the speaker who is leaving the stage. Mm -hmm. Before they leave the stage, they're already edifying us. Mm -hmm. So. It sometimes it becomes redundant to keep repeating the right. same message he's already stating, as James uh, yeah. eloquently stated. They do. Uh, they will spend ten, sometimes fifteen minutes, just edifying the heck. And these are my people, and they're hugging us. And these guys saved my life, and I sent my dad to them. And this is why we bring them. And Fan Merrill has these people. And then all of a sudden you sit there, hi, I'm Dave Chapman, the medical corporate headquarters, and, and you're repeating the same <laughs> message, and it becomes, mm -hmm. so you want to learn how to play off of what he says. Right. So typically, James does this very, very well. Uh, most of us that have, have done it for a while, we, we, we in turn sort of edify them at, at the same process, and then use that to roll into our presentation. Yeah, and the other thing that I do, I, I, I wouldn't recommend you guys do it right away, but a lot of times now, like uh, some of the speakers, you know, as they're leaving, because no one actually gives them any credit for what they do on stage. And, and keep in mind, they're up to three days from like 8 a.m. to mm -hmm. 6 at night, and all they do is talk. Wow. And so, you know, by the time we're there, we're the break. We're the only problem with a few breaks they get. So, like, if it's Jeremy, for example, or Pete or somebody that I work with, I'll say, as they're leaving, like, when they, they'll always shake hands, so there's always a handoff. Right. They hand the power to you, you shake the hand, power it back. And so when I go that, when they start to turn on my grab it back and go, you know, I'd like to give Jeremy a hand. How's Jeremy been doing? Three days up here just to educate. Uh, you guys probably know this. Jeremy doesn't have to do this. Jeremy has done more in his life than I could ever hope to do. But he's done so well that he just wants to give back. Can we give Jeremy a hand? Mm -hmm. And so you want to kind of grow it that way too. But you'll, I would recommend that out of the game. You'll start to see if you ever see us do it. We, we sometimes do that. It just, you know, kind of gives them some, you know, kind of action back. They are up there. I mean, they're up there a lot. Wow. So it's a grind. There's 17 presentations. Wow. Each of them are an hour to two hours and over three days. So you got to, if you understand what they're going through, then you know it's easier for you to relate that we just got to do an hour. We're in and we're out. You know, so that's a big deal. Awesome. Brent, you got anything? Okay, thank you. So you said you don't mention NCH in your intro? I no personally, I tell, I, I go right into my story. I know because. Every speaker now that's up there is veteran, and they, they're gonna, it's gonna sound, it won't sound right if you guys get up there and do a five minute intro on yourself, because everybody's gonna be just, 
those are off because they won't even hear it. That's my opinion. Though. You know, when, when I was training, Francis is big on it though. So while you're here, do your five minute. Interview. <laughs> I know. I'm in the right corner. Uh, I'm always doing when Francis is around. <laughs> so that's that's yeah. I don't recommend it. You guys, you know, it's real comfortable too. The only thing when you get up there, just you know, engage the people. They're excited to be there. You know, a lot of times people get you get really nervous. You know, just just whatever you got to do in your mind to not be nervous. That's really the only thing that that'll mess you up. You know, just get up there and be calm. Now I just try to take a couple, like uh, the way Francis taught me, is just kind of take in the room, take some deep breaths. You don't have to rush, you know, because right? we're transitioning when we're getting up there, so they're still getting situated. So just don't feel like you have to rush, or don't feel like there's a reason. You're not going to be challenged on the stage. You know, that doesn't happen. Awesome. Um, if you get that one person that tries to challenge you, what Adam told you to do, you know, it's a great question. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, or I'll talk great to you after. But whatever you got to say to keep yeah. it going. Just don't lose the flow, you know. But that, that's all I would recommend. It's pretty simple once you get a few of them going. And don't get jealous with all the lights. You have to run up there. He doesn't run up there. He's like slapping hands. And, <laughs> so just gotta just gotta go with the flow yeah. of the energy. My mother's doing it now. What's out of the thing? Texas, you did the run up. I did no, the run up on the event. I know. <laughs> yeah, I did the run up. Well, if they hype it up like that, then it, you know, fits. They will, they will. And like I said, keep in mind, the room manager tells you where you're gonna be, where they want you coming up. Like, nothing's guessed. You're not gonna walk in there. You'll you'll walk in the room and you'll, you'll say, where's the room manager? That's your first question, whoever you see, and they're gonna, or usually they'll be there and introduce themselves to you and say, I, I handle everything. If you need something, let me know. And so, like I said, it's not like, you know, the other events, this, this one's so coordinated. It makes it a lot, it makes it more comfortable knowing that everything's kind of that well planned. Right, and the right. Uh, builder speakers, are they? Out of San Diego, or are they nationwide? Nationwide, nationwide. They're all over the place. Yeah, they just travel, but they're out. You know, they work four days on, three days off, basically. Okay. Anything else? All right, I'm good, guys. Cool. cool assets, no taxes. Yeah, that's, that's right. I really like how you roll. That was good. Yeah.